let me remind you from Tuesday it's easier um, where we are so we did the displacement formulation basically we <coughs> collapsed the 15 equations into an equation where everything was in terms of displacement do you happen to know what that equation is called? Navier equation of uh, linear elasticity and then um, in some um, cases we need to uh, reformulate everything in terms of stresses only and this is a stress formulation so we did the substitution um, and this is where we have stopped so I just substitute um, uh, one equation in the uh, strain compatibility so the constitutive in a strain compatibility and I, I get this large equation here and then we were kind of working to um, simplify that and it is it's good because this is a part of this course is that you become comfortable with um, this notation so I didn't want to go too fast so let's look at it um, it's all in index notation so we have delta kk3 here you have substitution and you also know that um, from the Cauchy law that sigma ij comma j is negative fi so if you look at these two terms um, could you try to write them in terms of f looking at Cauchy relationship on your own this is called a warm up right warm up <laughs> And I do it too quietly and then we check. <coughs> yes. So a part of really my um, goal in this class is that by the end of this semester you become very familiar with uh, these sorts of operations. Um, so now if we have, if we uh, look at some of the terms here, so look at um, to the right hand side. Um, the first term is sigma m m k k k delta ij but then the um, second term is mmij and the third term becomes mmji which is the same as ij and then sigma mmij so they're all kind of um, become similar components so you can simplify you can see that you can simplify um, these terms um, you can collect them and simplify the equation so if we do that, um, so you have two of them here, one cancels out, and then um, on the other side you also have sigma kk ij, which is the same as sigma mm ij. So everything kind of, you can collect all the, those terms together. So um, with all these simplifications, if I now go to the new... Um, where is it? Um, to the new um, lecture. So I, I just write here a stress formulation continued. Um, so you can basically simplify the previous term. This is the first term, um, and then all of those sigma m m i j uh, comma i j sigma k k comma i j. If you uh, multiply them by their coefficients and collect them, they become something like that. 
1 over 1 plus nu sigma kk ij and then we have nu over 1 plus nu sigma mm kk delta ij and then there are the, the two um, forces so I bring them to the other side So that collapses to this, the previous equation. And we can uh, still simplify this equation um, um, by calculating sigma mmkk. To do that, um, we realize that if we equate, so if we let i equal to j, look what happens. then. The sigma terms, they all become similar to each other. So all of them become in the form of sigma mm comma kk. So you can actually get an expression for that. So um, let's do that. So then sig this is sigma ii kk. So i is equal to j, so here, and then um, here is i is equal to j, um, sigma ij becomes 3. So. So we know that sigma i i comma k k or k k i i yes please. Um, why are the should the body forces be positive? No, because um, yeah they were minus, but there was a minus behind them too. So that okay. yeah, does it make sense? Yeah. Did anyone else have the same concern? Should I show you? Guys, the spring break is coming. You should be all energized, happy, you know. Um, the level of energy is a little bit too low. How many are going away? Let's bring some energy. None of you? Just you, Clay? Zach is going away? That's why. That's why. Come on, go somewhere. Um... Got to work on the homework. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Alex, you really make my my spring break really bad. I, I will feel guilty the whole time. <laughs> well, uh, I hope you can relax a little bit. Okay. I yeah, it's two months. You know, at the end of the second month, you are here. So the question Tony asks is about this, this negative. So there are some negatives. Um, behind them, so they go on the other side that is still negative. Um, so um, if we do that, then um, we can actually have an e expression for sigma mm kk. So we can actually calculate it, right? All of these are the same. So it doesn't matter what I call them. And it turns out to be in this form. Okay. So if we substitute this equation in what we wrote down on top of this page, we get an important equation. So sigma i j comma k k plus one over one plus nu 
sigma kk comma ij is equal to negative nu over 1 minus nu f k comma k delta ij minus f i comma j minus f j comma i does anyone know the name of these equations so we had now via equation for displacement formulation what are these called no Cauchy are for uh, Cauchy has a lot of equations. Okay, <laughs> so a part of his equations are the the balance laws, the ones which are coming from. Well, these are called uh, Beltrami -Mich Mitchell equations. <laughs> Cauchy is French, Beltrami is Italian, Mitchell is Australian. So. A very international. So that's um, that's why this is not Michel, but it's Michel. Because for some reason I'm not allowed to misspell or mispronounce any French names. So <laughs> some of you know why. So. Uh, um. So here we have now two equations, one Navier equation, displacement formulation, and Beltrami Michel equation for a stress formulation. So um, remember what these are used for. We collapsed all those 15 equations to get these. So now we have these. Um, if you want to solve using displacement formulation, what do you think will happen? Um, if you if you get displacement, then it would be easy to get a strain first, right? And then a stress. You can see how it goes. And if you get a stress, what happens? First you get a strain from the constitutive relationships and then you have to um, from the partial differential equations to get the displacements. So either way um, you can get all uh, all those things that we are looking for which are remember these triplets. Any questions? So now the next thing is um, something which should look familiar to you um, also is the principle of superposition. Um, I'll write a mathematical definition and then I will ask you um, why do you think this is useful or in what practical ways you think this has any use or what is your experience with this principle. So um, what is this principle? If we have two sets of solutions for two boundary value problems with different boundary conditions, then what can we say about, um, let's, let's write it down. I think I want to first write the mathematical expression and then discuss it. So if we have one set of solution looks like that.
So that's uh, um, this is one set of solution for a boundary va value problem um, with body forces. We used F. Um, and surface tractions so um, if you have a second set of solutions I'm just using the superscript one and two. With the solution, um, let me the second the second. solution for the same problem but um, with different boundary conditions and body forces. happens is that then if I combine these two solutions linearly so it doesn't have to be this simple summation but you can generalize from here So this will be the solution to what? So we have a boundary value problem, so a certain boundary value problem with um, body force Fi1 and surface fraction on the boundaries Ti1. And then you have a second set of solutions for a boundary value problem with different sets of body forces and surface fractions. So if we combine the solutions linearly, what can we say? This is the solution to what problem? The same problem, but exactly to the same kind of combination. Now we just use the simple summation, but it can be generally a linear combination, right? Um, so, we body forces and So why can we say that? Why we are allowed to say that this is true? What makes our problems amenable to principle of superposition coding? Linear in what? Let's go back to coding. Because because all the equations are linear equations, right? There, none of them have square or any kind of thing. What <coughs> else? Probably, do you have something to add? Okay. The same. 
the, the relationship between all the variables are also linear. So when we talk about linear, linear is always something it's linear in something else. So we kind of have to be um, careful about that. But that's the reason. So you can't, um, you can't use it for things which are not linear or not a small deformation. We can do this in this free element. The second question I have for you. Who cares about this? Or what is this useful for? What is your experience? Why it is useful? Exactly, that's a, a nice way to put it. Both of you are right. So when you have a complex problem, then I just make a little sketch here. So if you have a problem which is complex, let's say it looks like that. Um, this is not like a, just a complex problem. Then um, if you know that this principle holds and you have ways to calculate problems of this sort, then you know that you can just split up or I like to think, of, think about it as a patchwork, like the, what um, Kingsley said, that you can calculate the solution to different components. And, and I, I think you have experience with that. Um, the next thing to talk about, and I think this is also familiar to you, is And this is where I have to be careful about my pronunciation of this. Sand and on principle. Well, um, he was a Frenchman. Um, so, now, do you remember anything about this French man with this principle, Prabha? What does um, this principle say? Maybe you don't remember the name, but I'm sure you remember what it is. Gerard. <laughs> That was good. <coughs> Gerald. Um, so there are elements in that which, which, which makes me sure that you have seen it, but um, I didn't quite understand what, how you described it. But, um, but there are some elements, so that having a distance, this is kind of what uh, this principle is about. Let me tell you, uh, I'm just trying to change the mood of the class, you all today look yeah, the, lo the sum of the energy in the class is somewhat low. I don't know why. <laughs> so, um, okay. So let's consider um, Consider statically, so I, I want to write this first again, and then we discuss it. Statically equivalent systems of applied forces. on a specific mm -hmm. 
portion of the boundary. So if you are engineering students, you all have taken a statics one of the first semesters you got here. Um, what does it mean, a statically equivalent systems of forces? What does this mean? No, no, go for it. I think you're saying if there are a lot of different ways you can get a net like static thing. You could, you know, you could have uh, a force going this way or a force going this way, but you can also have, have an equivalent vector going. What did we call this equivalent vector? Uh, resultant. Yeah. Exactly. So is it only enough that the forces have the same resultant mm -hmm. force? Effect, how do you, do you describe effect in a statics? Exactly. So um, you all said it together. So um, statically equivalent systems of applied forces means that um, based on the principles of a statics, you can replace forces with, this, with the resultant forces and they should have the same summation of forces which we call resultant in a statics and the same moment about one point. Moment is about some point and you know that if it is the same about one point it will be the same about any other point. You have seen this before. So for example if I want to um, have this example here I can put the force P here in the middle I can split it in two symmetrically and have P over two, or I can put a um, distributed load, and if, you know, this is L, this would be like P over L, something like that, right? And then you can calculate what would be um, um, that, that you have to make sure that these are statically equivalent. What um, this principle says is that um, the solution to the boundary value problem, um, if you go further enough from, from this boundary, so we go to where Gerald was, uh, was describing this principle. So the solution to the boundary value problem, including this boundary, would not know that you have different loads if you go further enough from the boundary. It wouldn't know. But you need to go further enough from the boundary. So that's what I think um, Gerald was saying. So now we are going to discuss what this means. So under these conditions, Solution to the linear elastic boundary value problem are practically indistinguishable. Spelling this right. Um, a short distance away from the boundary. This is a very peculiar sta a statement because it's very qualitative. <laughs> Right, what does it mean a short distance from the boundary? Um, it turns out that the effect of the boundary, it diminishes exponentially as you go um, inside the boundary. 
so um, there are some quantitative ways, ways to quantify it. But what you need to know is that if you go further inside the, the body, then you don't know um, what type of force it is. All you see is the resultant, basically. So now tell me, what would be the use of a principle like that? Why, do, why are we talking about this? Why is this useful? In, in, so that's exactly um, the point. So sometimes it's easier to work with a different format. If, for example, um, let's have these distributed and the point force there. Sometimes it's easier to work with um, not the exact force that you have in your problem, but with the statically equivalent of that force. Now, point force sometimes is easier for analytical expressions, right? Because you have an analytical expression. But if um, I don't know if how many of you are doing like finite element simulations. Um, so sometimes has has it happened to you that when you want to apply the force, you actually um, try to change the force into pressure, right? Because you don't want to have very large deformation at the, at, at the point of um, uh, at, at the at the point that you are applying the load to Cody what is your research area oh, oh. and Kingsley you have used this yeah. for so sometimes it's easier um, if you have um, um, now the codes are becoming so good that they take care of it, but um, like a few years back, maybe it, if you put a force directly on the boundary, it would, normally uh, you would have some problems around the force. So you would, you would actually turn the force into pressure. So that principle tells you that as long as you are not interested in the area near the, um, the load, then you are fine everywhere else. Right. Um, so now we want to um, say, okay, how do we solve the boundary value problems after all of uh, these th things that we learned? So we start by we start by two-dimensional problems because they're easier. So. Solutions. So, um, um we we'll start with I, I don't call it two two D problems, but two D approximations. Because we live in a three D world, right? Even if you consider a problem two D, you are approximating it. Um, so um, we uh, start with that, and we consider several cases that you are for sure are familiar with. So plane strain plane stress the so called generalized plane stress And then there is a, another one which is called anti-shear, which will appear in homework assignment. So indirectly. There. 
No, it's not, it's not hard. Um, so you may hear from people that they say plain strain and stress, um, the formulation in elasticity are exactly the same. They're only different by a constant, um, by a factor. But it's important in this class that you learn that there are, there are actually some fundamental differences. And the main difference from my point of view is that, um, and I want you to kind of at the, at the end to remember always that plain strain solution is exact and plain stress is approximate and you're going to see why. So, um, But I will also show you why people would say that, that they are very similar and they are just off by one factor. So we will see what it is. But it's important that you know um, what is going on. So let's start with plane strain. And typically, what when people want to teach plane strain, they start with giving you some physical background. So um, I like to do the opposite. So I want us to define it, derive the formulation, and at the end to see what problems fit that formulation, if it makes sense. So kind of reverse engineer the situation. Because you are all, um, I, I, I gave a survey in the beginning of the semester, and you all have heard about it um, at some point. So it's important uh, to understand, you know, um, what exactly is going on mathematically and what are the assumptions. Okay. So, um, we consider first Cartesian coordinate system and um, instead of x1, um, x2, and x3, um, we follow the notation in the book which is um, x, y, z, so you don't get confused. And also, this is the beginning of chapter 7, so we somewhat jumped over um, chapter 6 because we get back to that um, later on. So 1 to 5 we have um, talked about and then I've told you a little bit about chapter 6, but not completely, and now I jumped over 7. Um, so displacement components also, uh, I'm going to use the same notation um, as book. So instead of u1, u, u, um, u2, u3, um, it's easy. We we use um, u, v, and w. So how would we define? Plane strain. How would you define it? So the it turns out that the definition um, has not much to do with the strain, but with displacement. So we defined um, a plane a stra a strain case, um, a case where the, um, let's say, out of plane displacement is zero. So the definition is actually based on displacement and not a strain. So um, to be like formally defined, a deformation is said to be plane a strain.
if u is just the function of x and y, v is also only the function of x and y, and the out of plane, out of this x and y plane component um, of displacement, w is zero. So, so these we call in plane components, and you hear, and the plane is x y plane here. And when I say out of plane, uh, let me make sure that so this is the definition. Now we want to see what is the consequence of this definition in terms of uh, strain, stress. Uh, Navier equation, Beltrami, Michel equation, etc. So how, how things look like if you consider this approximation. This is pretty much um, what I, I'm going to do. So, and that's where I leave things a little bit to you so you um, don't fall asleep. So a strain. It is difficult. If you just sit and um, listen to me, it will be hard. Let me follow the same order I have here. So it's easy. So remember this that we decided we remember for the rest of our lives, right? So um, use that and try to write what would be um, with the definitions that we have U, V, W. What would be the components um, in planar strain? So some things will be zero. Try to see how it, how it looks like. Right?
And it's important to kind of pay attention to the fact that um, this is a function of x and y. It's useful. Common notation. Please don't use uh, because this is kind of what we want to do here. So this one is check that I'm not doing anything wrong here. So this is when I write this. That means that's a function of x and y. Did I make a mistake? Problem? Yes, so uh, this one, that's what you wanted to tell me? Yeah. So why is it zero now that you volunteer to explain this? Why, why is the first one is zero? And why is the second one is zero? So th these are the assumptions that we made. Thank you. So they are both zero, exactly for the reasons that Prabhupada um, explained. If I'm making so the components which have z in them, they become zero, but this is the consequence of the definition. Um, so what is important is if we write this now in the matrix form, which you have seen before. So the important message here is that the strain um, field is a function of
X and Y only. That's um, kind of what you knew here. I guess for to have enough time for the quiz, maybe I need to stop here. But to to just remember what we want to go from here is the next thing is to look at. You thought I forgot. Huh? A strength compatibility. Um, um, the quiz is just to keep you, because I know graduate students, you're all very busy with a lot of other things. And believe me, if there is no quiz, you will not review things. I've been a graduate student once, so I know exactly what it is. And if you don't review and if you don't recall, you won't learn. So. Look at it as you have to be excited about it and look at it as a learning opportunity.